Good morning. I have the honor this morning of introducing my dear, dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Barry Bryant, the Associate Professor of United Methodist and Wesleyan Studies here at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. I call it an honor, not just because of the distinguished vita which he brings, and it distinguished it is, distinguished in terms of pedigree, which includes membership in the convocation of the University of London, which is a significant accomplishment, an accomplishment held by very few human beings who walk the face of this earth. So indeed, we are honored to have you for that. But not only that, a PhD from King's College and a a uh, degree from that distinguished institution of the East, which we from New Haven call the Other Blue. Distinguished also in terms of his scholarship, which includes numerous articles and presentations and the forthcoming book, Know Your Disease, John Wesley's Doctrine of Sin, which is being published by Emmeth Press. Additionally, though far from an afterthought, Dr. Bryant has a long and distinguished history as a pastor here in America and across the pond. I wonder if this last career note is not the most significant because while having grounds for self-satisfaction, having grounds for puffery, as it were, we all know that Barry Bryant is a hum humble man who seeks not to be known as righteous, but rather simply as a decent man. Now, what is not captured adequately in his vita is what I have come to know as the passion of his life beyond his wonderful wife, one of the finer human beings that God has ever created. Barry has another passion in life. And that is justice for the Palestinians in their struggle to live with the dignity which attends to all of God's children, particularly in their own homeland. It is just here that the man who we anxiously await today is most visible as one who's caring for those whose commitment for those whose struggles are not his own, whose advocacy only brings difficulty, whose advocacy only brings scorn, that his continued dedication to that is the mark of truly what I believe is a fine man. Beyond having a deep commitment to scholarship, he has a deep commitment to justice. And all of this, I think, is because of a strange commitment that he has to an odd idea that I tried to find a bit about, but I'm still trying to research a bit more. Maybe you all know something about this odd idea. To do all the good that you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. So I introduce to you now my beloved colleague, notable scholar, and passionate advocate for justice, Dr. Barry Bryant, who comes to bring his sabbatical lecture. <clears throat> uh, uh, chatting with, with Brent before, I said that uh, my fear is, is not that he's going to say something, but I, I am. I'm, but I'm not. It's my fear is that I'm going to. He's going to name me as something that I am. So uh, it's, uh, it's humbling indeed. Thank you, Steve. Um, these lectures typically start with a word of gratitude, and I would be remiss if I didn't start this one in the same way. First, to the 
faculty colleagues who uh, uh, voted to recommend my sabbatical to the president, to the board, and to the president, allowing the rector and the board for granting the sabbatical. Um, it's really been an on, part of an ongoing project. Uh, the book forthcoming is um, Wesley's Doctrine of Sin, but it's actually more of a Wesleyan theological anthropology. And a lot of the work that I drew out of that into this uh, will be present along the way. But also, uh, while I was starting to write, we went into the throes of general conference uh, with an impending split uh, threatening on the horizon of Methodist history. And so it was really difficult for me not to take that into consideration um, as I began to write this in the final draft. And hopefully, uh, it will uh, be coherent and, and make sense uh, after it's, it's said and done. In 1965, the noted Anglican scholar Henry McAdoo delivered the Hale Lecture at Seabury Western Seminary just across the street from where we sit. In the opening lecture, Hooker and the liberal, liberal method, McAdoo argued that Anglicanism does not have a theology as much as it has a theological method, a method of scripture, reason, and tradition. And it has Richard Hooker and the laws of ecclesiastical polity to thank for that. In that regard, the Methodist nut has not fallen from the Anglican tree. For a rather long time now, neither does Methodism have a theology as much as it has a theological method. It is otherwise known as the quadrilateral, consisting of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Methodists have Albert Outler to thank for that. There is one difference between the two, however. The quadrilateral adds experience. And of course, Methodists didn't invent the quadrilateral, we just trademarked it and put a capital Q on it. It's largely because of the quadrilateral that Methodists don't have a theology as much as Methodists who do theology, which is typically contextual and preponderantly practical. This is not a criticism as much as it's an observation. While the quadrilateral is called Wesleyan, it is at best only three-quarter Wesleyan. It's more accurately described as Methodist. Neither is that intended to be a criticism as much as it's just an observation. Indeed, it has its proponents and its opponents, and just a review of this literature would take more time than we have today. Regardless of whether one is for it or against it, most agree it has cast a long, long shadow over much of everything else occasionally causing many a Methodist to quip, I am Methodist because we believe in the quadrilateral. There you have it. Epistemology has overshadowed Christology, and we have our square peg. Neither does Methodism have an ecclesiology as much as it has an ecclesiological concept, otherwise known as connectionalism. As Russ Ritchie notes, the term connectional is generally used as an organizational classification. Quote, employed, it distinguishes denominations with centralized authority, governance, and structure from those that lodge such prerogatives in the congregation. Methodists understand connectionalism institutionally. Just as Methodists didn't invent the quadrilateral, neither did we invent connectionalism. By this definition, it could be argued Catholics are connectional, Anglicans are connectional, Episcopalians are connectional, my mercy, Presbyterians are even connectional, Nazarenes are connectional. There are many denominations that are interrelated institutionally and connectionally. Now we have the round hole, connectionalism, at least for now. After being examined by economists, United Methodists have been told that we have about 15 years of an economically sustainable connectionalism unless things are turned around. The movement that became a denom denomination may one day have to reinvent itself as a movement. 
The problem that has quadrennially plagued Methodists from our very beginning has been when Methodist pegs and circles clash at general conference. Or to change the metaphor from one of Euclidean geometry to one of quantum physics, and, and for the sake of, of uh, intellectual integrity and academic honesty, I got this from Big Bang Theory and Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> Our biggest problem is when contextual theology and connectional polity collide like some atomic particles in the super collider we call general conference after which many of us are left looking for the Higgs boson God particle. Contextual theology stresses and stretches connectionalism, causing it to lean more toward a congregational polity more often than not. This is why Methodists frequently fret at schism. In fairness, neither did Methodists invent schism. But in the 19th century, we worked to perfect it. There you are. Between 1784 and 1895, the Methodist Episcopal Church would split no fewer than 10 times. We have been schooled on schism. First of all, we get 1784, formation of the Methodist Episcopal Church, although it could be argued that's not so much a schism as a church plant as a result of geopolitical uh, situation. We'll talk a little bit more about that. 1787, Richard Allen split from St. George's MEC to form the AME, ultimately in 1816, only after the trustee clause and the right to own their own property got litigated by the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court. 1792, James O'Kelly split over the Episcopacy to form the Republican Methodist, taking many of the abolitionists with him, and that's not Republican in the same sense that the Republican Party. Those folks actually end up in the UCC, strangely enough. 1795, Peter Williams Sr. split from John Street Methodist Episcopal Church to form the AMEZ. 1843, the Wesleyan Methodist Church, a group of abolitionists split over slavery. 1844, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, the slavers, split over slavery. 1860, Free Methodist Church, the abolitionists split over slavery, among some other things. 1870, the Christian Methodist Church, originally called uh, the Colored Methodist Church, split over slavery and the issue of a segregated church in the Reconstruction era. And uh, a free Methodist, uh, the, the Christian Methodist Church over race and segregation. And then finally, I want to include 1895, Phineas Frazee who was a United Met uh, a Methodist member of the Methodist Episcopal Church in Los Angeles, who wanted to start a ministry to the homeless in the inner city of LA. The conference wouldn't let him, so he left. And he, he uh, began to uh, start a ministry that would eventually merge and form uh, the Church of the Nazarene. If you pay attention to that list, Methodists have split more over race and the Episcopacy than anything else. We are the schismatic child of a schismatic parent. We split from the Church of England, and the Church of England was split from the Roman Catholic Church as a result of a very nasty royal divorce. My suggestion that the quadrilateral is not fully Wesleyan needs to be defended now. In 1757, Wesley published what would become his longest treatise. The Doctrine of Original Sin, According to Scripture, Reason, and Experience. <clears throat> the title is provocative. Throughout his life, Wesley declared his love for the Church of England, its liturgy, and its doctrines. So why would a devoted Anglican such as Wesley abandon Richard Hooker's Anglican methodology for a defense of a doctrine as significant as original sin? He is proposing from the outset that he would use a concoction of scripture, reason, and experience, not the Anglican recipe of scripture, reason, and tradition. This is a provocative schema and was tantamount to a subtle discontinuity with Anglican theological methods with significant implications. 
Was scripture alone not enough to defend the doctrine of original sin? How does Wesley utilize reason in this approach? Why the exclusion of tradition? Would the use of tradition in this instance have been deemed inadequate, problematic, or both? Why the substitution of tradition with experience? Of course, this title page is not the only place where the words scripture, reason, and experience make an an appearance. They are copiously scattered throughout all of his work. However, nowhere else do these words appear in closer proximity to each other than they do here. So where does Wesley get this? To find the answer, we need to turn to a little-known book, but I think one of the most significant in his intellectual formation, and that was his Compendium of Logic. Wesley's compendium was based on textual, uh, on a text crucial to his intellectual formation, namely Henry Aldrich's text, Artis Logicae Compendium, published in 1691. This was the text Wesley studied while a student at Oxford. He also used it while a tutor at Lincoln College and moderator of disputations at the college. In 1750, Wesley translated Aldrich's Latin text into English so that it could be used at Kingswood School, a school he founded principally for male and female children of coal miners in the area. Later that year, he published it as a compendium of logic. Now, to get a better understanding of this, we need to realize that the work of Aldrich was itself dependent on the work of another man. Peter of Spain, who was a Thomist, a Dominican, a logician, and Pope John XXI. This work was a standard medieval textbook of logic and went through 166 reprinted editions. It has been said that Wesley's publication of the Compendium of Logic breathed life into the dry bones of Henry Aldrich, and because of Peter of Spain's influence on Aldrich, he inadvertently resurrected Thomism. Epistemologically, to be clear, Wesley stands in the Thomistic tradition, and nowhere is that more evident than in the section on the scale of ascent, and please note the spelling, it is A-S-S-E-N-T, and not A-S-C-E-N-T. It's the linchpin, I argue, of Wesley's epistemology, and it immediately put him at odds with the Enlightenment. More significantly, John Locke, with whom he involved in an ongoing debate with his essay, Locke's essay on human understanding. Wesley had significant problems with the equation of reason equals revelation, an argument that Locke pretty much makes in books three through five in his essay on human understanding. The degrees of ascent, as articulated by Wesley Aldrich and Pope John XXI, Peter of Spain, were regulated by the grounds of probability, which becomes a subtle form of epistemological gambling. What are the odds that something is correct and true? For Peter of Spain, Aldrich and Wesley, it came down to the degrees of probability. The veracity of one's experience depends on whether or not the senses have been deceived. uh, Wesley said rather skeptically, men are often deceived and often deceived. The reliability of one's own experience is limited by deception and misperception. Notwithstanding this, an epistemology of testimony can be developed on which the uh, truth of certain statements regarding the experiences of others may be verified. Wesley's own extensive use of testimony in the Methodist societies, especially the individual testimonies of religious experience that he eventually chronicled in the Armenian magazine, are a good example. But the intent of Wesley's epistemology of testimony was not just to verify the truth of an individual's experience. His understanding of experience was simply one, was not simply one of privatized piety. Wesley rejected the notion of a solitary Christian and instead insisted in one of his most misunderstood phrases, uh, namely, no holiness but social holiness. By that, he did not mean no holiness but social justice, 
what he meant instead that sociality and communion are essential to Christianity and indeed being a Christian. To turn Christianity into a solitary religion is to destroy it. This is as close as he would come to making a similar argu argument that John Zizulus makes that being a, is communion and an ontological category. With the epistemology of testimony, Wesley sought to verify the truth, verify and confirm the truth of biblical doctrine. He fully expected experience to verify scripture and the truth of certain Christian doctrines, such as justification, assurance, entire sanctification. In the Armenian magazine, many testimonies were extracted from personal narratives and religious experiences. This meant testimony. Indeed, much of religious experience was narrative dependent. The challenge of connectionalism has always been the interweaving of a multiplicity of narratives. Just as there has been a disposition, predisposition, for Methodists being processed theologians, this is why there is also a predisposition for Methodists being narrative theologians. While individuals deceive and are deceived, reason and nature, on the other hand, quote, are not deceived and seldom do they deceive their followers, end of quote. As the scale of ascent proceeds from experience to reason, Wesley understands the nature of the relationship between faith and uh, reason, and it starts to unfold here. It began by implying that reason and nature were in some ways less affected by sin than sensory perception and consequently more reliable. In other words, reason is less uh, susceptible to being deceived and, and uh, deceiving. Although, uh, you know, I've, I've often argued that uh, in addition to a limerick context, uh, we need a faulty syllogism context, contest to show, uh, for example, I, uh, the example I use in class is God is love, love is blind, Ray Charles is blind, therefore Ray Charles is God. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, reason does uh, have a potential for uh, faulty syllogisms as well. Reason may be used in an analytical sense. Wesley wrote, to ascend higher still, it is certain reason can assist us in going through the whole circle of arts and sciences, of grammar, rhetoric, logic, natural and moral philosophy, mathematics, algebra, metaphysics. It can teach whatever the skill or industry of man has invented for some thousand years. It's absolutely necessary for the due discharge of the most important offices, such as those of magistrates, whether of an inferior or superior rank, and on he goes. Furthermore, analytic reason could help provide religion with an understanding of its scriptural foundation and to help what Wesley called the superstructure of the Christian system. In other words, it helps provide coherence. It helps provide coherence to the multiplicity of narratives and the multiplicity of theological loci. Ultimately, however, while reason is less susceptible to deception and consequently more reliable than experience, the most reliable of all was divine revelation. This is so because Wesley confidently asserted God can neither deceive nor be deceived. Presupposing such confident assertions in the doctrine of revelation is the nature and character of God. God does not lie. Upon this simple truth, from the doctrine of God, revelation rests as the surest form of knowledge available. Now, of course, this is subject to its own critique. I uh, don't have time to get into here, but uh, uh, this is uh, uh, where he comes out uh, in terms of the scale of his hand. A scripture, reason, and tradition. Experience has always been the joker in the deck. All experiences of culture, identity, and the development of any hermeneutic starts with experience. While there's no time to fully develop this, I do want to point out that Wesley also goes on to use experience to develop a concept of personhood. He insists that personal identity is not limited to consciousness, although consciousness is constitutive to personality. What he's trying to do is to separate personhood and personality. A person is what one is, and that is not determined 
merely by either consciousness or identity, but by existing as one created in the image of God in relation to God. So a funny thing happened to tradition on the way to the quadrilateral. It's obviously been left out, and it's been left out in the scale of ascent and the compendium of logic. In fairness, that was not Wesley's doing. However, for all traditions, even Christian ones, one must ultimately be subjected to the authority of Scripture, and the interpretation of Scripture is not immune from hermeneutics. The interpretation of Scripture engaged an implicit and unstated hermeneutical method that was used to render judgment on any tradition. On this basis, and I'm opening up a can of worms here, he rehabilitated heretics. For example, after reading John Lacey's The General Delusion of Christians with regard to prophecy, Wesley developed sympathy for the Montanists, saying they were, quote, real scriptural Christians, end of quote, saying, he doubted whether that arch-heretic Montanus was not one of the holiest men in the second century. And I know I run an even greater risk in sharing this next example, but I'm compelled to do it anyway. In virtually the same breath, Wesley showed a significant qualified sympathy for another arch-heretic, Pelagius. <laughs> whose real heresy was neither more nor less than this, the holding that Christians may, by the grace of God, not without it, that I take to be a mere slander, in other words, he's saying he believes that uh, Pelagius is being misread by his opponent, uh, namely one St. Augustine of Hippo, um, by the grace of God, to go on to perfection, in other words, fulfill the law of Christ. And then by attaching him to himself the label Arminian, he identified himself with one who had been condemned as a heretic by the sin of the dork. When he aligned himself with the heretics, he also distanced himself from the traditions of his own church, the Church of England. He openly admitted that he differed from, quote, the mitred infidels of the Church of England. Uh, his reference uh, to the bishops, of course. The failures of Wesley as a missionary in Georgia are, of course, legendary. The great irony of this to me is that adherence to Anglican canon law is what caused his biggest problem. In the colony of Savannah, this contributed to his undoing. And there are two, at least two examples of this. Because of Anglican canon law, he refused to baptize an infant when the, mother's, uh, the child's mother would not uh, allow Wesley to perform the baptism by immersion, the preferred method for everyone, not just adults, but uh, children and infants also. And of course, there is the uh, more infamous or famous example of uh, him excluding Sophie Hopke Williams, a former paramour lover, a girlfriend, if you will, from the Eucharist. Um, ask me later what Wesley wrote in his diary about the experience. Um, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share it with you privately. But, uh, uh, I have in class, but it, it, inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, his diary was written in a cipher that no one had the key to until Richard Heisen wrote he discovered it back in the 70s working on his dissertation. Uh, and he was, he was actually doing reading in Benjamin Ingham's diaries, and Ingham used the si same cipher, and he had the key to it. And Dick Heitzen writer tells the story, he said, I'm not an emotional or an affectionate man, but I got up and I ran out, and I needed to find someone to tell about, and perhaps even to hug. Um, um, so all of this is due to his adherence, strict adherence to Anglican canon law. What scholars now know is that much of what drove Wesley out of Georgia was not simply his insistence upon Anglican canon law. He had been to Charleston, and in Charleston he insisted on talking to some slaves. And as a result of his first-hand encounter with slavery 
with African people being enslaved in the city of Charlestown, he was from that day to his death an abolitionist. By this time, the shift in the colony of Georgia was being made to move it from a slave-free colony to a slave-owning one. And it was in their best interest to get rid of this Anglican priest from, um, from uh, the, the north of England out of their colony. After Wesley's return to London and his Alder, Aldersgate heartwarming experience, he started playing all of a sudden fast and loose with Anglican canon law. And he played fast and loose with it wherever he thought it impeded the mission of Methodism. He frequently stretched it to the point of snapping. For example, when he resorted to field preaching, causing him to remark, I could scarcely reconcile myself at first to the strange way of preaching in the fields of which he, uh, Whitfield, set me an example on Sunday having been all my life till very lately so tenacious of every point relating to decency and order that I should have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it had not been done in a church. Then on, on top of that, he started using lay preachers. This was done based on a distinction he eventually made between prophets and those who preach and uh, the, the word and priests, those who administered the sacraments. And in doing so, he bifurcated word from table, a split that we have not been able to recover from as Methodists to this day. Then we could go on and talk about his use of women as exhorters first, then eventually as preachers. And while adhering to the Book of Common Prayer, he also advocated the use of extempore prayer and questioned the administration of baptism by only an ordained priest Wesley even dismissed the Anglican tradition of Episcopal ordination only when he took it upon himself to ordain, beginning with Thomas Coke, who is the first in a long list of Wesley ordained preachers. So instead of a quadrilateral, we're now left with a triangle. And somewhere we need to insert the scale of ascent. And if we were to do that, it would look like something like this. Actually, it looks more like a pyramid, but it does a triangle, I suppose. Experience for Wesley was the least reliable form of knowledge because we can deceive and be deceived, although through the epistemology of testimony, it can be fortified as an aggregate experience. Reason is more reliable because of the use of logic and rationality resulting in coherence. However, the most reliable form of knowledge is revelation and scripture because it is based on the nature of God as one who can either deceive or be deceived. But this is more than a scale of ascent. It, it is an epistemology. And even then, it is not just an epistemology. It is the basis for a hermeneutic. And so, at best, our current quadrilateral is three-quarters Wesley. Now, I want to quickly show, I, I put this up in class. I think it helps students to best understand the, the tension between uh, what I've been describing here as Wesley's postmodern. This is, this is the postmodern experience. It's an upside down pyramid, if you will, where experience informs our reason and reason ultimately informs our scripture. This is what I think a contextual theology looks like. And so the problem is when we use the same components that Wesley provides in the scale of ascent, but we use them in a different order with a different emphasis and, and to some extent perhaps even a different priority. So how did Wesley use scripture, reason, and experience as theological sources? What did it look like when he began to work with them? We've just seen how they are arguably used to critique and modify the tradition contained in Anglican canon law. And this was done specifically where Wesley thought it was impeding the mission of Methodism. Those are several potential case studies one could use to further investigate the issue. But the two I want to mention here are the way he constructed what could be described best as a socially progressive hermeneutic used to address the issues of poverty and slavery. 
Ironically, somewhere along the way, Wesley started to act less like a Thomist and more like a Dominican. To challenge Anglican tradition was to challenge ecclesial power, but to challenge poverty and slavery were to challenge what he called execrable villainies. That's his phrase. And their entrenched power structures of a society to side with the poor. The 18th century rhetoric of this execrable villainy is, uh, means uh, not just villainy, but evil. I would describe execrable villainy as those things which deny or obstruct human flourishing and inhibit the renewal of God in human beings. Wesley used the phrase in reference to wealthy people's treatment of the poor. Admittedly, Wesley's personal experience of poverty growing up in the rectory at Epworth and the casting of his father Samuel in debtor's prison helped to shape his attitudes towards the wealthy and his empathy for the poor. His journals and letters are replete with scathing comments about the treatment of poor people by English society and eventually created a hermeneutic that gave him clarity and perspicuity about the wealthy and their treatment of the poor. For example, his first foray into field preaching was based on this well-known passage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord to deny the poor their God-granted deliverance and liberty was an execrable villainy, an evil of the highest order. He would write, O oh, England, England, will this reproach never be rolled away from thee? Is there anything like this to be found either among papists, Turks, or heathens? In the name of truth, justice, mercy, and common sense, I ask, where is the mercy of thus grinding the face of the poor, thus sucking the blood of a poor beggared prisoner? Would not this be execrable villainy? So robust was Wesley's preferential option for the poor that it led Ted Jennings to conclude that Wesley was a beta version of a liberation theologian. While many consider his Georgia experience a miserable failure, it was his personal encounter with slavery that did much to help him realize the image of God had significant moral and ethical implications. This too was an execrable villainy and a social evil that must be removed from society. This eventually led Wesley to publish thoughts on slavery, his scathing and blistering attack on slavery itself. Leon Henson has argued that what one actually sees in Wesley's thought on slavery is an emerging theological foundation for human rights, derived from a relational understanding of the image of God. On this basis, he drew very confident conclusions regarding the evils of slavery. To Wesley's credit, he preached fearlessly against slavery in Bristol in the very beast of the slave trade. Uh, and I, I tell students, if you ever get to go to the New Room in Bristol, which was the, the, uh, the, one of the headquarters of Methodism, pay attention to the architecture of the sanctuary. You cannot get access to the pulpit from the sanctuary floor. Get people from having a direct line from the floor to the pulpit to strangle the preacher. And I'm, I'm convinced, just as the institution of slavery in influenced southern church architecture to create the slave gallery. The antithesis of that is the new room architecture where uh, uh, Wesley's preaching against slavery influenced there not being direct access to the pulpit from the sanctuary floor. Let me uh, find out where I am now. I should have dropped the finger here. Um, this preaching, uh, uh, as I said, eventually the architecture of the new room as his preaching so outraged the good people of Bristol that the sanctuary had to be designed to take it, the, this into uh, to account. Uh, I want to show you now, um, yeah, this is the last letter Wesley ever wrote. Um, 
And it was just four days before his death. And it was to William Wilberforce, a member of the Clapham sect, which was a group of evangelical Anglicans who were deeply into, deeply committed, involved in social justice issues like poverty and slavery. Uh, there actually was a movie um, uh, came out several years ago, um, uh, Amazing Grace, that detailed uh, the Wilberforce and his work in the House of uh, Commons to uh, bring them into the slave trade. But I want to highlight uh, the bold part there. Reading this morning, a tract wrote by a poor African, I was particularly struck by that circumstance that a man who has black skin being wronged or outraged by a white man can have no redress. It being a law in all our colonies that the oath of a black against a white goes for nothing. What villainy is this? And of course, in this same letter, he talks about the execrable villainy of slavery. These experiences help to influence a hermeneutic of execrable villainies and the social evils, in particular of poverty and slavery. There were indeed other factors that helped to shape this hermeneutic. For example, the image of God and the salvation that was seen as liberative in nature. And this reshaped, in turn, Wesley's reading of the passages pertaining to slavery. It also reinforced his reading of the Gospels and the focus of Jesus on the poor and this life of Christ being one to be imitated. So what happened to this version of Wesley's hermeneutic of execrable villainies when Methodism came to America? That's when it gets interesting. In short, it was reshaped through a series of general conferences, which was itself um, uh, shaped by geography, economics, ultimately race and slavery, and it taught Methodists ultimately how to create a hermeneutic of discrimination. Several things happened to Methodism in America in the 19th century. When Methodism arrived to America in the mid-18th century, it was the result of immigration. Immigrants from Scotland and Ireland primarily who brought their Methodism with them. American Methodism owes its existence to immigration. What happened next should certainly come as no surprise. As Methodism shaped, expanded into the South, it started to grow, and as it started to grow, it became dependent on plantation owners, and as it became dependent on plantation owners, it became dependent on cotton money. And while Methodism started out as a slavery-condemning church, because of this process, by 1820, it had become a slavery-defending church. So much for Wesley's authority. Francis Asbury was more willing to kick out lay preachers from the connection for administering the Eucharist than he was for owning slaves. Both bishops uh, and Asbury and Coke knew that to take a stand against slavery meant that Methodism might not survive, and even if it survived, it might not thrive. The Quakers, with their pacifist and abolitionist tendencies, were great examples of what they did not want to happen to Methodism. And in spite of John Wigger's rather sympathetic treatment of Asbury in his book, American Saint, Francis Asbury and the Methodists, let us be clear, Methodism's first, first bishop sacrificed slavery and with it black bodies and lives on the altar of church growth. It was not long before the likes of Holling McTyre and William Smith began to construct a slavery defending hermeneutic. And by 1844, Methodism split not over the immorality of slavery, but over a matter of discipline and whether a slave-holding bishop could serve the entire connection. Well, let me just add, I've been saying for a very long time that Methodism would split directly over the issue of homosexuality, but it would split when either a gay or a lesbian bishop would be elected. Just saying. Slavery had, by this time, created a regionalism in the church, not just around the issue of slavery, but fundamentally around a slavery-defending hermeneutic. I also believe that if cotton had grown in Michigan instead of Mississippi, 
we would be having these conversations about Detroit, not Jackson. That's just a way of saying that the model of agriculture as commodity created an economic force around cotton that drove the creation of a slavery-defending hermeneutic that was used to defend the economics of white privilege. So much for the execrable villainy and the evils of slavery. I think the second thing that happened came as a result of attitude towards slavery, and it was the shift towards Methodist respectability. This was due largely to the efforts of Nathan Bangs. To his credit, Bangs was against slavery, but he also desired the upward mobility of Methodists. The problem was not so much that Methodism desired respectability, but that it came at the expense of abandoning the poor. So nowhere is this more apparent than in Methodist architecture and the shift from modest buildings to Gothic monstrosities. Other than, uh, the other thing that I'm constantly telling students is that learn how to execute a skyline. Architecture is ultimately a theological statement. Justification of wealth and slavery taught Methodists how to eventually discriminate against black and poor white folk. Instead of becoming a hermeneutic of execrable villainies and the evils of race and poverty, it became a hermeneutic of white privilege and respectability. Now we have an explanation for the many schisms of Methodism in the 19th century. Go back and review the list around race and ultimately the issue of poverty. To be clear though, folks in the South are not and have not been the only ones to embrace this hermeneutic. It has become the default hermeneutic to defend white privilege uh, in general. And here, I want to thank Lucy for, this is actually a letter we have in our safe. It's the last letter that Wesley wrote to America. And it was written to one Ezekiel Cooper. Uh, Ezekiel Cooper, by the, the time he received the letter, and it was written in uh, February of 1791, uh, and Wesley died in March. So in all likelihood, Wesley died before Ezekiel Cooper got the letter. We also have, uh, uh, I think, nearly all of Ezekiel Cooper's autographed papers in there. I keep waiting uh, on being able to recruit a PhD student to come and just dig into that stuff. But Ezekiel Cooper was uh, the, uh, the manager of the book concern, the first Methodist publishing house. But he was also a strong abolitionist. And so Wesley uh, writes the letter, and this is what it says. Um, you know, it's, it's he, he the, the first of it starts, you know, the death is starting to grip me by the hand. Uh, but uh, I want to, to point out the highlighted part in particular. See that you never give place to one thought of separating from your brethren in Europe. Lose no opportunity of declaring to all men that the Methodists are one people in all the world and that it is their full determination so to continue. Though mountains rise and oceans roll and to sever us in vain. Now, to me there are several things significant about that. Um, first, by September of 1784, Wesley, the strident royalist and consummate supporter of colonialism, knew that Anglican colonial ties with American Methodism would have to be severed in order to create a fledgling church to strike out on its own. So he severed the ties that bound English and American Methodism, acknowledging that there was no longer any real connection between Methodism in England and Methodism in America. By December of that same year, American Methodism indeed made plans to disentangle itself from both the English church and state, and did so at the Christmas Conference of 1784. It could be called a geopolitical schism, but it functioned more like a church plant. The Christmas Conference also informed several other important items. First, it affirmed Wesley's authority so long as he was alive. I think we've seen just how long that lasted and why it was so short-lived. 
Secondly, it drafted a strong statement condemning slavery, aligning themselves with Wesley's own anti-slavery sentiments. Thirdly, the office of bishop was created in spite of Wesley's protest and outrage. And for this reason, it's difficult for some Wesleyans to embrace both Wesley and the Episcopacy. And for the same and other reasons, not all Wesleyans are Methodists, and not all Methodists are Wesleyans. Yet strangely enough, Wesley is in here pleading with Cooper for British Methodists to be given a connected relation. How could that be? They were no longer institutionally bound. And Wesley could no longer make appointments in America. And after all, a, after a, a bloody revolutionary war, all the political rancor, all the social malice that could possibly, what could possibly show that the Methodists are one people in the world? Was Wesley delusional? Uh, I, I've also always said, it, had there been psychotropic drugs in the 18th century, there might not have been a Methodism. Uh, but how might Methodists find unity, not amidst the diversity, but in spite of their geographic political, and even theological separation. Was this a premonition of a world Methodist council? Obviously, Wesley did not provide any answers to these questions, and neither did he lay out a plan for how all Methodists are one people in the world. But he does seem to, refer, to be referring to something deeper here than an institutional connection. Wesley believed that Methodists had a mission to reform the nation and the church. However, as I have said, we are the church that Wesley sought to reform. In the way Wesley used scripture, reason, and experience to reform traditions of Anglicanism, we could do well to follow his example and use them to reform Methodism. Methodism can't reform until it is itself reformed. And it will not be a hermeneutic of discrimination that will reform us. Here's what I think, and this is just my opinion, take it for whatever it's worth, I think what ultimately binds Methodism is the fight against execrable villainies of our society and the evils of racism and poverty, just to name two. Or to paraphrase the United Methodist baptismal vows, it is to resist evil, oppression, and execrable villainies in whatever form they present themselves. Thank you. So we want to thank Dr. Bryant for a wonderful um, lecture and um, some very new ideas, execrable villainies. I think that will be heard again in these parts. Um, so we have five minutes, so we have time for a couple of questions. So a couple of If you let me give short answers. Okay, so we have time for a question. Um, I'm neither a historian nor the son of a historian, so I need to just, how did Wesley's views on slavery and poverty fit in with his uh, fellow Tories? Was he out of step or? Right, well this has always been a puzzle to a lot of scholars. I think that Wesley's solution to social problems was through evangelism and the conversion, for example, of one slave trader at a time. John Newton is a splendid example of for a case study in that. I think also, you know, Wesley believed that economic implications were a part of Christian perfection. Earn all you can, save all you can. You know, as I've told you, Wesley was a sanctified capitalist. But he believed that once you took up money, you were engaging in spiritual warfare with the God mammon. And that the only way that we could adequately uh, solve the problems of, uh, of, of poverty were for uh, Methodists to become better stewards of the wealth that they had uh, that they had been given in, in terms of um, a spiritual redistribution of wealth to the poor. His Tory politics, notwithstanding, you know, that, that I think that that's uh, you know, another set of problems, but I think that's, he was conservative politically, but he was socially progressive. Yeah, yeah, I sort of. More about the personality, personhood yeah. dimension. What, what this comes out of, Wesley does a critique of 
Locke's essay on human understanding. And he publishes it in the Armenian magazine. And in it, he concludes, no Methodist should ever read Locke without Wesley you know, as a guide. Wesley was an empiricist. You know, he believed that there was nothing in the mind that has not come through the senses. That created a problem for his doctrine of original sin. You know, if you're going to adhere to an epistemological blank slate, then how do you account for uh, um, a, a doctrine of original sin? He said that he came um, into the human body through a soul, and the soul entered the human body in a fallen state. So what you get in distinction to Locke, who wanted to maintain a mind-body duality, what you get in Wesley is a soul-body duality. And that's the reason why he can say you can lose your personality. And part of this was his response to a quote from Locke, said Socrates awake and Socrates sleeping are two different people. And Wesley said, you got to be kidding. That's my paraphrase. you got to be kidding me. Uh, and, and he wanted to construct an understanding that there is a, a role that consciousness plays, but it does not determine our humanity. Uh, there's been some debate about that. Um, you know, some of the sources that we think he drew upon wanted to argue for that, but um, there's no clear evidence, I don't think, that Wesley bought into that. But that the soul, when it entered the human body, it entered into a fallen state. And that way he could sort of hang on to his empiricism and uh, you know, the doctrine of original sin. Oh, absolutely. We live with that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, and as you, if you've ever been around someone with dementia or Alzheimer's, you know, they can lose their memory, but that they've not lost their humanity. You know, they've lost their personality, but they've not lost their humanity. Uh, and I think that uh, you know that's. I think there's some. Well, and I noticed Mylene had to go. She sent me an email. She explained why she had to leave. So um, I think that there are also some strong connections between this theory of personhood and the relationship between personality and even the image of God, uh, especially with Kohat. Um, you know, I've, I've not had time to fully explore that, but uh, just through conversations with people, to hear me talk about Wesley who know Kohat, you know, you see lights go off. Yeah. Yeah, when you, you see, studying Wesley is like panning for gold in a big river. You know, you have to sift through a lot of sand to get the nuggets, and then you have to put the nuggets together to get something of any value. Uh, and it's, it's laborious. You know, Wesley studies is a laborious process because you've got to read, you know, I tell students, just go into the library and look, you've got this much journals, you've got this much let, uh, letters, that's the raw data of narrative, and then you've got this much sermons, and then you can put all of his theological treatises basically in two volumes. And so the, the challenge of narrative theology is the amount of narrative you've got to read through in order to construct the theology. And when you begin to piece all of that and the fact that Wesley lived in every decade in the 19th century, you know, he lived to be 80, Eight, 89 in a century where the life expectancy was 43. You know, he basically outlived everyone he had known uh, in most of his life. And so to put all of that together uh, is, uh, is a bit of a challenge. But I think, you know, my, my point being is that if we focus on connectionalism institutionally, then uh, we're going to find ourselves disconnected uh, institutionally and connectionally, probably in the near future, unless a miracle happens. Uh, but also, I think that um, if our history should teach us nothing else, that this, the day that we make uh, a decision to split, we should also make an appointment in the near future to get back together. Because just as the 19th century was a century of schism, the 20th century, for the most part, was working to bring the church together. And unfortunately, one of the things that got sacrificed in 1939 is that the regionalism uh, uh, created by slavery found its way into uh, the, uh, the jurisdictional system uh, of American Methodism so that you get the central jurisdictions where we put all the people of color, especially the black folks. 
you can stay in uh, the Methodist Church, but we're going to segregate the church and put you off to the side. Uh, and uh, you know that was not uh, uh, abolished until South Carolina was the last one to abolish the Central Conference that was a part of the Central Jurisdiction in 1973. The reason why I say there has never been an issue that has more profoundly shaped our history, doctrine, and polity in the United Methodist Church than the issue of race and slavery. Well, we want to thank you once again. Thank you. Dr. Bryant. <clears throat>